So we launched a, a new show uh, a couple of days ago called Democracy 101 in the lead up to our elections. It's kind of an important part of what we want to do going into the new year, because I think that these elections, it's not just my opinion, it's a lot of people's opinion. These elections are going to be probably the most important ones since 1994. And um, many people have the opinion that these could be the ones, these could be the decisions, these elections could bring about the decisions that will really change the course of, of direction for South Africa. Um, certainly, I hope so. Uh, the course of direction for us in the last couple of years has been decidedly downward. And today we're going to be joined by someone who can hopefully shed some light. Um, he certainly has been one of those people who has added enormous value when we've had him on the burning platform before. But in Democracy 101 for today, we're going to speak to Wayne Sussman, who's an independent election analyst. We thought we'd pick his brain a little bit today. There's so much to talk about. So, Wayne, first of all, welcome and nice to see you. Thank you. Good morning, Gareth. Good morning, Pantubonka. Do you do you agree, by the way, that these the upcoming elections here in South Africa are going to be pivotal, decisive, all of those words that the analysts like to throw around? Or are we just going into another election cycle where we can expect more of the same. Um, I certainly get the feeling that on the street and when I have conversations with people and looking at the comments on this show, uh, people are enthusiastic about these elections in a way that they haven't been for the last few. 100%. I definitely think this is the most pivotal elections in South Africa since 1994. Um, the length of the ballot paper speaks volumes. You've got many new entrants running this time who believe they can shape up the selections. Some of them, by the way, I think are running because they've seen what parties with one or two seats can do in our metros. So I'm not saying yeah. everyone's running for little reasons. But uh, yeah, Gareth, I think it's going to be an absolutely pivotal election. Um, and it's the first election in since our democracy with the ANC is under real threat. And um, in our three most urban prov provinces and also on our national ballot. So, Wayne, let's just talk about something that happened uh, this week. We know that uh, Jacob Zuma has launched or rather has thrown his support behind a party that we didn't even know existed up to a couple of days ago called the Mkonto Esizwe Party. We know Mkonto Esizwe was the ANC's armed wing during the struggle. Um, I don't know who's in charge of this party. I don't know who the main players are. But uh, Duduzile Zuma, who's his daughter, came out and said, no, no, the former president is not going to support the ANC, nor will he campaign for them ahead of these elections. Do you have any thoughts on that? Because it's been a very muted response in the media generally. And I do think that the ANC are probably more worried than they're letting on about this. Correct, Gareth. And also we've seen uh, the formation of Roger Jardine's party. I think middle of yes. December, mm. there's so much happening uh, I wonder if it's the best time to launch a political party, especially when the elections are bound to be, we're hearing, May next year. Uh, running an yeah. election, particularly in South Africa, vast, uh, the, it's, a, it's a large country, rural settings, urban settings, nine, uh, many, nine provinces, many different languages. It's, it's a complicated thing to get a party going. By the way, we heard some months ago that this, that this MK party was registered to the IEC, and that's why it's important to monitor these things. And I was wondering, and I was obviously proven wrong, that is this uh, some kind of red herring? Why is there this mm. MK party being formed? Will Jacob Zuma really go along with it? Well, he has gone along with it. Look, Jacob Zuma is uh, older today, certainly than he was in 2009, where he uh, captured the hearts and minds of many voters, particularly those in KwaZulu Natal. And he's older mm. today than he was when he ran for his second term in 2014. Will he have the energy? Does he still have the relevance? This is a question not just for Jacob Zuma, but also someone for Ace Mahashula. These are veterans in our political stage. Do they have the energy? Do they have that ability to connect with first-time voters? One thing about Jacob Zuma, and I always say this in politics, is focus is absolutely critical. It's absolutely vital that when I hear a new party say we're going to go after every town and township and informal settlement in South Africa, we're going to win the votes in Bazan in the Eastern Cape to Boxburg and Ekruleni, I... Okay. 
not the answer I typically like to hear. I like to hear parties who are focused because I think then they have a clear game plan. If Jacob Zuma is going to be very focused on Kozul and Natal, I do think, uh, and the MK party, I do think they can let on better. If they have a proper strategy, um, mm -hmm. then possibly they can not just hurt the ANC, by the way, but also a party which is at a largely great 2023, the IFP as well. Yes. Um, I want to play a, a little clip quickly. Uh, this this is something that, that Ryan found yesterday. Tabo Mbeki had some things to say about why he won't be campaigning for the ANC. And I thought this is quite hard hitting. First of all, I haven't seen Tabo Mbeki speak for some time. And he's he's certainly, you mentioned Jacob Zuma being older. Tabo Mbeki is, is really in his twilight years now. And the fact that he's being brought out and that he feels the need to speak out about the state of the ANC is telling in itself. But listen to these words, and then I'd like to hear your thoughts on this and yours, Bakabantu, uh, because I think that this is this is a probably a very uh, scary proposition for the ANC to deal with. Uh, two former presidents, Jacob Zuma, who we've discussed, and now Tabo Mbeki, um, saying things that they they probably don't want stalwarts and leaders and 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 elders like these two saying take a listen to this i don't think the anc understands that reality um, it is true that you have got many greedy people many corrupt people if if, if i ask the question I ask the question, why is the ANC, which marginalized people, as we, today, as we are saying, why is it behaving like this? I say to the ANC comrades that when I, you say I must go campaigning next year to, to say to people, vote ANC, <coughs> how am I going to do that to say vote ANC? when I know very well that the, the branch of the ANC in this constituency is led by a criminal. Yeah. You can't. You can, you can, it's not possible to go and say vote ANC for a criminal. So, obviously he's not uh, talking just about that one municipality or that one place, but he says greedy, uh, criminals. These are things that w the, you could not say this stuff a couple of years ago, right? Correct. Um, and again, Tabo Mbeki, uh, you could see in that video, is also no longer a, a spring chicken. Let me just put it out there. No. So this is yeah. the juxtaposition, Gareth um, and Bakabantu. Basically, what we are seeing is, let's go back a few days ago to Mavuso M. Samang. I thought that this would be a consequential decision. He has an ANC luminary, a person uh, whose blood is black, green, and yellow, uh, who said that he, he could no longer support the ANC. A few days later, uh, he walks back that statement and rejoins the ANC. Also, what was telling for me was the launch of uh, Roger Jardine's party. And again, he Sorry, also let's has just, let's just, the, let's just uh, if you don't mind, on Mavuso and Samang, I mean, clearly then his credibility is shot after that because he's been pressured to say, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. But no one believes him now, right? Yeah, his credibility is shot, but there's, there's an old adage that it's very cold outside the ANC. You see mm -hmm. many, uh, we've seen a number of politicians, of elected, um, of members of parliament, councillors, leave the DA over the last few years. Yeah, you have someone who isn't even a current office holder. Of course, he's benefited from his association with the ANC and his links to the ANC. But my understanding is there's no current benefit to being linked to the ANC, who after a few days, yes, his credibility is shot. But at the end of the day, it just shows that it's much harder to leave the ANC than any other political party. I mean, besides for Malema, I, I, I'm battling to think of anyone else who's done successfully over the last few years. And this is going to be the challenge for Zuma, for, I mean, uh, with regards to Tabo Mbeki's speech, 
We, this isn't the first time he's done this. I think in yeah. 2016, there was that backhanded compliment of an endorsement of the ANC. I don't know, or just 2021. It was a very feeble endorsement. But ultimately, it's even though I think Gary emerging in a place in our society, you just showed a video of Thabo Mbeki. Think back to those elections in 2004. The ANC was... Uh, the dominant actor in society, whether it was business, civil society, sport, arts and culture. Uh, just think of uh, musicians who were endorsing an opposition party in 2004, 2009. Very few and far between. Media, every facet of society in 2004, 2009, uh, the ANC, yeah. particularly 2004, the ANC is actually dominant. That started to fray over the last few years. That's what makes this election very, very interesting. But I wonder... Just just back to the point, uh, is whether Thabo Mbeki will say this just before the elections, what we just saw in the video. I mean, he said it. So why does it matter if he reiterates it before the elections? Are, are people, are we so stupid in South Africa that we forget these things after politicians have said them? Um, and, and why is it suddenly fashionable now to talk about how bad the ANC is? But They've been bad for the last couple of years, and nobody said anything until very recently. Does it take a certain level of dissatisfaction for people to have the scales pulled from their eyes? I think it does, Gareth. I think to a certain degree. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bakabantu. No, I think no, it does go, take a certain. It does take a certain level of dissatisfaction. And I think we've all reached that point where even like when you spoke to credibility of someone like Msimang, where he he can't justify it anymore where his credibility is shot because he went back with the begging bowl probably. Uh, but like someone like Tabo Mbeki, where you have been asked, how can you let this go? Where the ANC does also like invoke the, what's the narrative? This is the ANC of Mandela. This is the ANC of Tabo Mbeki. This is the ANC of yesteryear. But now they are still here and they have to say, no, I do not endorse this. Otherwise, it's their name. Hmm. Yeah, Wayne, do you want to add to that? Sure, thanks, Bakabantu. Basically, I, I think this is exactly why, and I want to laud uh, you for having this Democracy 101 session. This, and we said this at the beginning, 2021, and I know we don't often lend too much weight to local government elections, our midterms. We saw for the first mm. time in a democratic election in South Africa, the ANC fall below 50% when all the votes were tallied. Not just below 50%, but 46%, to, to be honest, well sure. below, uh, relatively well below 50%. That is yeah. why, Gareth, I think um, we are seeing the ANC fray. We're going to see more, uh, again, the artists. I think back to this in 2004, You wouldn't see a prominent artists play at the concert of another political party you're going to see that more and more and that might be a metaphor of how the ANC is losing its grip but again uh, Gareth as I said on the burning platform when I had the privilege of sitting in that show uh, I think it was about a year or two ago, two years ago um, do not count the ANC out I think there are large swaths of this country particularly rural areas who believe ANC can and will do a better job than the EFF or any other political party. Okay, so let's talk about the EFF for a second. You brought them up. Um, people try their best to avoid the EFF, but they're a powerful player in South Africa because they're the third biggest party, but they're also often the kingmaker in regional and local elections. I mean, they don't directly run or, or govern any single municipality in the country, but they have tremendous influence. And Julius Malema makes a lot more noise than any other politician by weight class in this country. And then he seems to get way more attention from the media as well. So we can't ignore them, even though people say, well, they're not a major player. They don't really have policies that are noteworthy. Um, what is your take on the EFF and whether or not people should be either paranoid or at least concerned about what they're doing? Yeah, I mean, you're seeing in these opinion polls, the EFF's votes, um, some polls, I think, have them about 10%, 11%, others have them all the way up to 19%, running the DA close, even some scenarios that they eclipse the DA. Uh, mm. and that would be a stunning turn of events if they had to emerge as the official opposition. Um, yeah. 
Look, the interesting thing, Gareth, is that Julius Malema, uh, after Kenneth Meshwe, uh, Monsieur Lakota, even if he runs again, and uh, Bantu Holisa, who I'm going, I, I'll blame myself, but here's a reason why why I butchered Baka Bantu's name at the beginning, because I was thinking of him. Uh, <laughs> Bantu Bonque Holomisa. These are the, the longest running um, party leaders in Parliament. So Julius Malema is a veteran. This will be his third election. Uh, leading yeah. the EFF into an election. Far more experienced than the IFV leader, Sir Ramaphosa, uh, in that regard of leading a party into parliament. So right. what was interesting, what would worry me, what should be worrying the EFF is that if you look at their growth trajectory, um, is that a lot of that growth in 2019 and 2021 was in the province we've been speaking a lot about uh, in this interview, and that's KwaZulu-Natal. And... Um, mm. By the way, Jake, Jacob Zuma's MK party could even be taking away votes from the EFF in KwaZulu Natal. So let's see. The other thing, Gareth, if you look at the EFF's results in 2021, in places like Rustenburg and Polokwane, which are key parts of the origin story of the EFF, Polokwane mm -hmm. is where uh, Julius Malema hails from, the Sashecho Township. Rustenburg yes. is right next to Marikana. Um, the EFF went backwards in these two municipalities in yeah. 2021. And in the three major urban centers of Gauteng, their vote either uh, plateaus or goes backwards. So where's the EFF growing? The EFF is growing, and this is a strange anomaly in 2023. They have won wards, uh, with this, and this is a very good stat for them. They've won wards off the ANC in tw since 20, the 2021 local government elections. In um, it's five out of the nine provinces. It's the Western Cape, the Northern Cape, the Northwest, the, the Free State, and uh, Gauteng, and Ipulanga, six of the provinces. That's a rem they've just got to do Limpopo, KwaZulu Natal, and the Eastern Cape. Easier said than done. So that shows that the EFF can beat the ANC in many parts of the country. But where they're really growing, Gareth, and again, uh, I've just them to worry about how they're doing in Gauteng and KwaZulu Natal and Polokwane and Rustenburg. They're growing in small towns in South Africa. Now that's hopeful. That means that they're going to 2024 knowing that they are growing in certain parts of the country. The challenge is I would much rather be growing in metro areas and in large yeah. towns and small cities than in small towns. So that's where the EFF is from an electoral perspective as we end this year. Uh, what is happening in metros? Uh, because we, we're seeing these coalition governments, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. What do you suspect? And again, a lot of this is asking you to, you know, look into a crystal ball and, and you, you're not Nostradamus, but it's certainly a more educated guess than most of us would have. What do you think is going to happen in, in the major metros, particularly Johannesburg, Tswane, Port Elizabeth, Cape Town, I think is pretty much a, a done deal and the DA if they continue to run it properly don't face any credible or serious threats in, in Cape Town but are there others like Etequini, Durban that, that may surprise us or are, are these also going to be predictable results? Yeah so why are we talking about metros is because they are, there's obviously large reservoir uh, large reservoirs of votes there they're going to be consequential mm. in this election are we going to see this urban rural split continue? So when it comes to Gauteng, which has three metros, Johannesburg, Ekruleni, and Chwane, what's been an interesting mm. feature, Gareth, of our politics uh, in 2022 and 2023 is that at present, and I always say political parties can turn things around if they work hard and uh, change the trajectory, um, they ain't in trouble with black voters in Gauteng. Uh, this is clear from by-elections in Soweto, by-elections in the West Rand, um, uh, places uh, like the Reeds uh, in, in Centurion, where there's uh, quite a number of black voters, small pockets of Randburg. In many, in, in I think all but one by-election in Gauteng, the ANC share amongst black voters has continued to decline. And I think this is one of the big uh, worries for the ANC going into uh, the 2024 and election year. Uh, with regards to Cape Town, um, mm. look, Mayor Jordan Hillis has built a, a very big profile. 
I think is a very popular mayor, but there are a few uh, challenges for the DA. Um, can they hold? Uh, so the Patriotic Alliance, I think, would be their main concern going to this election. Yeah. Gayton McKenzie is um, an and uh, he is. Uh, it's, it's very hard to gauge how far he can go. I, I've got no doubt that he can do well in rural areas, but can he do what he did in the south of Johannesburg amongst those coloured er amongst the coloured communities in the south of Johannesburg, Ennerdale, Riverley? Um, and can he do that in on the Cape Flats? I know he's going to be very yeah. focused on it. He's made some inroads in the Western Cape. So that would be the DA's main concern. Just very quickly on Etiquini. This is, and wow, we're speaking about Cosmetel a lot, which I love doing. When we think of Cosmetel, it's got two main um, reservoirs of votes. It's Durban, Etiquini, and then the Imsenduzi, Peter Maritzburg area, which is part of the Ungumun Luvu district, the Kwazulu-Natal Midlands. The yeah. ANC has been killing it in the last few by-elections in 2023. The ANC is having a very tough time in by-elections in KwaZulu-Natal. But towards the end of the year, they have been showing some growth. And this is something which I'm going to watch greatly because if the ANC can hold on to its support in Etiquini, it might be able to defy the odds uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. Okay, so uh, who, who, who are their main opposition in KZN? Great question. So... Uh, we, we, we could have done a four-hour show in KwaZulu-Natal. It's a fascinating province. When we think of KwaZulu-Natal, just spoke about Etiquini and the Umbu-Luvu district, the Midlands. There we go to the northern KwaZulu-Natal area, uh, large towns like Richards Bay and Newcastle, but also traditional IFP places like Ulundi. So that uh, the IFP won another by-election off the ANC northern KwaZulu-Natal in the last round of by-elections for the year. It's a very impressive result. When I look at these results, I don't just look at the overall result. I drill down voting district levels. There's a lot for the IFP to be enthusiastic about. When it comes to um, that, Gareth, what's key, and I alluded to the beginning of the show, Southern Kozula Natal, Port Shepston onward all the way to the Eastern Cape border, places like Umzumkulu, these are rock-solid ANC areas. The places, yeah. parts of the country where Nkutusan Lanini Zuma hails from. This was, and I've said this many times and written this many times, this was, J whatever you may think of Jacob Zuma, whatever those people, any supporters who, who are watching us or listening to us, uh, the one thing they can, categor will cate can must categorically give Jacob Zuma credit for is Southern KwaZulu Natal. He turned this into one of the safest ANC areas in the country. The returns in 2009 and 2014 in southern KwaZulu Natal in the Harry Gwala district and the Ugu district, uh, that in many instances um, uh, was the same as returns in rural Mpopo, rural Mpumalanga, and rural Eastern Cape. That is going to be key with the emergence of Jacob Zuma. So the big opponents, so I'll just answer your question, are the IFP. You have Chris Pappas from the DA, who I think can energize Metro voters. Um, and let's see Jacob Zuma's party. Those are the, And, of course, can the EFF? The EFF had, have had a terrible 2023 until, but can Jacob's, um, Julius Malema find form? So th that's what the ANC would be worried about because of the tell. I, I was going to uh, say, when it comes to... Yeah, go yeah, ahead, because I've kind of dominated this and you haven't had a chance. You go for it. I was going to say, in terms of polling, right, how how accurate is our polling results? Because the DA also, like, we have been projecting, like, wins over the ANC in certain districts. Like, they've been leading the polls. That's my first question. <laughs> yeah, I want to drink what those DA pollsters are drinking. <laughs> I think it's very unlikely. Um, look, I think often the media writes off the DA too easily. The DA has, the, in its uh, previous iteration, the DP, has been the official opposition now for many elections. I'd be very surprised um, if they don't return as the official opposition. But there's no opinion poll. Again, when someone gives an opinion or gives a projection, we, one's got to take a step back. The DA's best ever election result was under Musi Maimani in 2016. Um, and that was um, every, all the cards align, all the stars aligned for the DA in that election. Jacob Zuma was very unpopular. Opposition was frag. Well, 
we're seeing a lot of fragmentation in our politics, but the opposition then was very weak. And a lot of that just mm -hmm. fell into the um, support of the DA on election day. Um, the DA also started attracting middle-class black voters in Gauteng. The DA uh, swept the minority votes, uh, white, uh, English-speaking, white, Afrikaans-speaking, urban colored vote, India, the Indian vote. The rural colored vote is a bit of a competition. We can't say today, besides bar for the Indian community and amongst the English-speaking white community, that the DA has the same gr grasp over those communities or, or groups I just mentioned. Yeah. So I think it's unlikely. Bakabantu. So this is my second question, is what do we do about, like, because every time I have read, like, a result of an election, we have failed to create these new voters. Like, you speak of this voting block that Zuma created basically from South KZN up until like rural Eastern Cape, Bizana, Kokstad, all those places. I know those places. Those places shine green, uh, with black and yellow. So what about, because what you're talking about, the Democratic Alliance votes, those people that they converted during Musi Maimani's era fell down to the FF plus. They fell down, like even now, Zuma fragmenting from the ANC. That takes away from these main voters. And I've never seen a political party convert those people into new voting power, like a new voting block. It's a great point. So I think if I also first time voters, we've seen a lot of initiatives, a lot of money, smart business people putting in money into voter registration campaigns. I look, we're still waiting for the full data to emerge from the first registration weekend. And this is important. Very important statement I'm about to make, online voter registration for the entirety of 2023. But it seems like uh, we haven't shot the lights out of voter registrations, which concerns me. And that's a conversation mm -hmm. for another, another time. What does it mean for our democracy if less young people, less people participate in the elections? So, so and that goes back to your point. I think it's uh, easier to find uh, so first of all you have to find voters who are registered it's, it's one thing mm -hmm. saying it's so let's let me go off on another quick tangent the eff have done very well in src election campaigns student representative council election campaigns how does but are we comparing apples with apples in those src mm -hmm. election campaigns like ubuntu um you go online on your online portal at uh, your university, put in your student card number, you don't have to show an ID, and you vote. And then you go back to drinking your beer or your cup of tea, whatever you're doing. It's it's very quick, painless and simple. No, uh, no getting in, no having to find transport to go to a polling station. When we vote, we need an ID book, we need to be registered, and we need to show up at the polling station we are registered to. Much, much harder. And that's why it's vital. So again, when I think of this, uh, and I think it's uh, re relative to what you're saying, if we think back to Brexit um, and the vote on Brexit, the genius there was that the Leave campaign were able to find voters who hadn't voted for a very long time, who had sat elections out. Can a new political party, can an existing political party go and find those millions of South Africans who say, we no longer vote because we do not believe our ballot can make a difference in this particular election. And I think it's easier said than done. I think there's a lot of despair out there. And I really hope that we are not going to see our lowest ever turn out in the national election this time around. I actually believe it's a fallacy that the EFF has done good in SRC politics. I famously participated in an SRC election year, uh, 2016, Witwatersrand. So there, the EFF got the vote, right, by winning 60% of the people that voted. And we only found out that the people that voted were 40% of the university. I as much as to speak to a democracy, we would say the people that participate in a democracy, their vote counts. But that was not a true representation of them winning anything. But yeah, but move, <laughs> and they couldn't even get 100% or 40% of the university. But that's like, but now when we speak to places like the multi-party forum or the moonshot pact, like, does that move the needle for certain people? That Like when you look at like political and like when you're analyzing the political system in South Africa, does that do something for South Africans? Yeah, so I was quite critical of the multi-party charter when it started, because just to remind uh, the listeners and the viewers, 
you are vote. You're not going to be voting for the multi-party charter. You're going to be voting for a party in the multi-party charter. But what does the multi-party charter do? It gives. It's able to say, look, together we are bigger than what the DA got in 2016, considerably bigger by about six or seven yeah. as a starting point, six or seven percentage points. It also tells donors, look, we and donors are key in this election. And I, don't just look at donors as nefarious actors. I think uh, a lot of donors, whoever they're giving money to, often have the the intentions of the country at heart. Um and so this is key. I think it galvanizes donors to say, look, together we can bring parties together. We can work with the parties. And this is an idea, even if we don't unseat the ANC nationally, that the ANC potentially gets unseated in KwaZulu-Natal Gauteng and the Western Cape remains in DA's, the DA's hands or the DA in yeah. another multi-party charter party's hands. So I think that's – but what the multi-party charter will need, I believe – and this is easier said than done. This is what we saw the challenge with Roger Jardine. Is I think if it has a candidate, um, a person who there is an agreement on, and it's I understand what the smaller parties are saying. They're saying, how can we agree on a candidate before the election is done? That's a very valid point. But if it can have a big name behind it, um, I, I think it can gain a few percentage points. And by gaining a few percentage points, it'll gain a few. Um, it'll gain a few more rands, and it could be a virtuous cycle. Um, okay, and so and it also shows a kind of maturity. Yes. Sorry, you, you bring up Roger Jardine, and you're talking about we need powerful politicians and important characters and people who can really galvanize support. I, I haven't heard anyone say horrible things about Roger Jardine. I don't really know that much about the guy myself. I had to look him up, first of all. I wasn't even sure what he looked like. And as much as he seems like a good guy, and I, I honestly haven't heard anything negative about the man, um, he is he the is he a person who will galvanize support? Is he a well enough known quantity, or is he just a hero of the business community who are going to try and foist this guy on us as a kind of, you know, like, almost like the way that the DA t tried to window dress themselves with Musi Maimane and it all fell apart. Is that what's going to happen here? Yeah. Or Mampele Rampele was oh, another yeah, example. Yeah, exactly. um, oh. I think the Roger Jardine, um, and again, we've had the launch now. Um, we, I spoke about it earlier. I thought it was a terrible time to launch uh, a political party mm. on a Sunday in December. Um, I think it's fallen flat very quickly. I like being proven wrong. Um, so I don't think Roger Jardine uh, was the silver bullet um, to take the opposition parties and the multi-party charter up by a few percentage points. Um, and I wonder if that person exists right now, Gareth. Just one thing, and uh, this is a, a, a bit of a, a, a facile, a weakish comment, but basically we've seen... There's this whole idea of politicians and hair. Um, and just if I had to give some advice, the, what South Africans had known about Roger Jardine was that he had this incredible moustache. And when he launched the political party, the moustache was gone. So I don't know what that. So South Africans, is this Roger Jardine? But they really didn't know it was Roger. Those who didn't know him really didn't know it was him. The day he launched the party because that moustache, which has been associated for many years, was gone. So that was whoever gave him that advice gave him poor advice. Terrible. And uh, these things matter, right? I mean, politics, a lot of it is performative and a lot of it is is posturing. Um, and, and I don't know that someone who's in business necessarily knows how to do that stuff because while business includes a lot of politics, politics includes a whole lot more than business. A hundred percent. And Gareth, one of the things I do um, is when I go to events, I monitor politicians and I call it the selfie test. So I was at a yeah. national day of a, and look, this is a pretty elite setting, but there are waiters, staff, etc. cetera. There, there are it's a, a lot of people attend these events. And I noticed mm -hmm. at the 4th of July celebration this year of the United States, um, at the United States Embassy, Gayton McKenzie, uh, people were queuing to have their selfies with him. And he was standing next to some pretty prominent position, uh, uh, politicians. Another one was Chris Pappas recently. 
recent Diaz had an event and there were other prominent politicians near him. People were running up to Chris Pappas to get their photo taken with him. I don't okay. think people, wherever Roger Jardine, and I hope he's having a, I hope all politicians put their feet up for a bit because they're going to have to hit the ground running early 2024. I don't think people this morning are going to be running up to Roger Jardine to have their selfie taken. So again, I don't think uh, to reinforce the point that he is the the silver bullet for the opposition project. Okay, um, so let's talk about other opposition people here. Uh, Herman Mashaba, you mentioned Bantu Holomisa earlier. Um, there's still COPE, believe it or not. There's still a COPE. I don't know who's in it. I don't know what they do, but there's still a COPE. Um, Mangosutu Putelezi has exited uh, stage left, and now the IFP, we're not even sure what's going on there. Are, are these other rats and mice parties worth paying attention to? Yeah, the IFP is certainly a party worth paying attention to. Um, by up until the last few rounds of by-elections, I think they were the overperformers of the year. Um, in um, yeah. and again, that's focus. I spoke about focus earlier. Mm. And look, I understand the reverence, uh, Gareth. I was once on television speaking about um, co commending the IFP and its new leader, Velen Corsini Chlabisa. And yeah. I was saying it's amazing yeah. that uh, this was before. Uh, President, uh, the founder Butelezi had passed away, said it's amazing that the party is thriving. People said the IFP had fall apart um, under their new leader. And they said, no, no, no I, I, they, they chastised me. No, no, Butelezi still in control of the IFP. So can the IFP stay together? Can they build up? Yes, I understand the reverence um, that Butelezi is literally the Nikhlabisa, you've got his teacher, you've got a, um, a guy who I think is eloquent, I think can connect to the base. He comes from very rural northern KwaZulu Natal. Can the IFP have the vision to carry on building his brand and get more voters, maybe younger voters who were, were not willing to vote for the IFP in the past, who might be willing to mm -hmm. vote for him this time? Um, look, I think Herman Mashaba uh, in 2021, to talk about Action SA, he controlled much of his own lane. This was the lane for those black professionals um, who voted for the DA in 2021 and ANC, uh, lower middle class to middle class black voters who were upset to the ANC. And he tr pretty much, um, th th he had very little entrance in that lane. You saw, you've seen since then that uh, Songhezo Zibi and Musi Maimani have entered the fray. Uh, you yeah. have seen that, um, as I said, the, the, there's the DA, which seems to be more disciplined. Now, I think they'll battle to win back those black voters who vote for the DA in 2016. But some of those white voters who vote for Action SA might come back to the DA. So I think Mashaba was in a stronger position in 2021 than he is today. But having said that, I think Action SA is more established than Rise in Zanzi, more established than Build One South Africa. And I look, the media really got behind Mashaba in 2021. I think it's going to be harder in 2024. But I, I think uh, if he remains focused um, on more of the urban provinces, certainly Gauteng, certainly Johannesburg, um, there are good signs for him in Soweto, in some Soweto by-elections. Mashaba can definitely be a factor in this election. Then just with Bantu, Holomisa, Gareth, I've said the word focus, and we can do the um, we can do the tally with the producers after the show many times the show. What always mystifies me is we know that uh, the United Democratic Movement uh, have historically <laughs> done best in uh, uh, the Mtata Butterworth area. But yet, yeah, so trying. I would say, go where your voters are. Go where your voters are. And you'll see Bantu Olamisa campaigning in Cape Town and Johannesburg and, and Durban. Instead of, if I was him giving advice, I would literally spend 95% of my time in those communities which voted for you impressively um, in that local government elections. Was it uh, 2000, I think it was, uh, when he ran for the first time. Um, so that is what I would uh, advise uh, Holomisa. Otherwise, he's going to be, continue to be a reduced factor. If, if he's not focused, UDM and COPE might – look, it's very hard to disappear because you only need uh, – you let, need less than a quarter of a percent to make it back. But it will be a very tough time for them. 
Uh, can I just ask quickly, um, you brought up the media just a second ago, and the media has this habit of, we, we have, and I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the media, but we have this double standard in South Africa where we have extraordinary depths of understanding and levels of criticism which we deploy against the DA, for example. But there's a kid glove treatment so often with the with the ANC because, I, I don't know, maybe because they're the biggest player in the economy and maybe because the media isn't as independent as the media pretends to be. But when it comes to like backing horses, uh, a lot of our media institutions and publications have done a terrible job over the last 10 elections. They've got it wrong almost every single time. And yet they don't seem to pay a price for that lack of ability to, to valuably ascertain what the, the next election might bring for us. They don't seem to, to lose uh, credibility uh, in, in, I don't know, audience numbers, sales figures, publication. Uh, it seems to me that they don't pay a price for how useless they are when it comes to the elections. Or am I being especially unkind because we're in the media? Well, I think we're seeing the A. I spoke about that ANC in 99, 2004 just dominated so many aspects of our society. I think you're yeah. seeing the media. There's no, going to be no rumor for it. I'd be very surprised unless yeah. this idea um, of an ANC EFF dooms the coalition. I do not see the media um, batting for Ramaphosa this time around. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who the media uh, gets behind. I think there's a lot of energy behind someone like Songhezo Zibi. I don't think Songhezo Zibi at this time is going to shoot the lights out in this election. So it'll be interesting to see whether the media can continues on the Songhezo ZB train. Uh, I think he's a, a he's a, a great guy, a smart guy. Um, and but I, I just I, I think that the so you correct the media needs to take a step back. It's the same we spoke earlier about the Brexit analogy. It was so clear yeah. that the media was out of touch with large swaths of South Africa uh, of, of the United right. Kingdom. Um, right. And we the media needs to be sure to not uh, to understand. Um, that this time might be very much different. But equally, Gareth, and let me uh, contradict myself, understanding South Africa also means understanding those deep rural areas which remain intensely loyal to the ANC. But I, I don't think we're going to see another bout of Ramaphoria this time around. Okay. Um, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground here, but one other last thing, the, the, the election itself. Do you think, because we had the IEC's deputy chief electoral officer on the show in our first episode of Democracy 101, we had Balian Tuli last week, who was very, very interesting. But the IEC, are they on top of things? Is it going to be a free and fair election? Should we worry about how independent the IEC is? Yeah, look, as you know, I deal a lot of data and analysis, um, and I look at priors. Uh, the elections have been ostensibly free and fair, and I think it will be this time around. Time is not on our side. Remember, that, and I'm sure Mbali spoke about it, or the IC spoke about it much better than I can, the, the third ballot. Um, so it's, it's, it's a different animal this time around. The, some of the, the election is going to be slightly different to previous elections. But uh, we have to be hopeful that political parties be vigilant against fraud, that they'll hold the IEC to account, uh, that the IEC will hold political parties to account. When we've seen the ANC or other parties lose power, uh, there has uh, nine and a half times out of 10 be a free transfer of power. We know on a local government elections that there have been hiccups, not just, by the way, it's I, I can give you ANC examples, IFP examples, DA examples, where it, it's been a, um, a, tra um, a long, frustrating hand of power. It hasn't been that swift. But largely, yeah. I have to be hopeful that elections are going to be free and fair, that Cliff Central are going to, and other media houses will uh, play its part in ensuring that and holding those to account. It's going to be absolutely critical. Okay, but, but you still you, you reserve some, um, let's, let, let's say you reserve a little bit of, of, of uh, cautious optimism 
Yeah, I, I'm having a sleepless night about it yet. Um, okay. Look, the, I, the IEC has to work against a very uh, close timeline. Will people be trained correctly? So I'll give you my biggest concern right now are those zip zip machines. Um, this can be a real bottleneck if the machines stop working. So you get large turnouts um, at a voting station and yeah. you have this bottleneck where they can't uh, ch check your barcoded ID or that piece of paper they give you. And then people yes. just go away. There were scenes in our last local government elections. Would it have altered the result? In a very close municipality like Nelson Mandela Bay, maybe the ANC would have got an extra seat or the DA would have got an extra seat. There were people waiting in the lines long after closing line, uh, long after closing time. So that's it. As long as the political parties hold the IC to account, I remain uh, hopeful. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else you want to throw in, Bakabantu, and then we'll wrap this up? Uh, no, no. Uh, Mr. Sussman speaks on a lot of like focus, right? Focus by political parties. But yes. I think also like voters should also think about focus. Focus on your neighborhood. Focus on what yeah. you want from this election. I think we're past the whole point, but we need to know that this is a pivotal election. You need to know what you want from it, though, even though it's pivotal. You need to know what you want. What can someone like Action XA speak to you? What does the EFF speak to you? What does the ANC speak to you? And then you vote according to those needs. I think that's a mindset that we all need to have focus to reiterate your words. Okay. Yeah, I think that's very that's very sensible. Wayne, thank you so much for your time. I um, really appreciate having a conversation with you. you. You certainly know what you're talking about. And I think we are entering a really, really exciting new phase for South Africa. Um, no matter what happens in these elections, it's, it's all of these parties are, are, are unsure of the ground that they're standing on. And that's a good thing. When politicians are unsure, the people can take some, some, ple some pleasure and some joy out of that, some, some reassurance maybe. Um, so I think let's go into this uh, with our eyes wide open. And as Bakabanti says, you've got to have some idea of what you want before you go to the polls and before you expect parties to make promises to you, hollow promises very often, about things they can't actually do. Uh, you've got to have very realistic expectations. Anything you want to add as closing remarks? Just one last thing. I, I spoke about it being the festive season. Politicians yeah. and IEC officials Rest now, but do not rest on your laurels in 2024. Very good. All right, Wayne, lovely to see you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to you for joining us this morning on Democracy 101. We will continue this in the new year. This is our last Democracy 101 for 2023. And before you blink, before you open your eyes, it'll be a brand new year, an election year. And we've got lots of really important stuff to pay attention to.